this morning, I want to continue in our series. Before I do that, let's just say this together if we can and uh, read this out loud. For whatever was written before was written for our instruction so that through patience and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So this morning we're in Parashat Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah. And so uh, first of all, let me just say uh, for last week, for those who are, who are watching online, we apologize for our live stream that went down. My, my favorite part of that whole thing is when people email me during the service while I'm preaching, your live stream's down. <laughs> is it? Well, I, I can't do anything about it, but thank you for letting us know. Seriously, thank you for letting us know. I hope today you are curled up in your PJs, drinking some hot cocoa and having a great Shabbat service, uh, because a lot of you who braved the elements today, uh, you get a merit badge today. I'm very proud of all of you for doing that. So as we go into the life of Sarah today, what an amazing story. And when Rabbi Ron came in this morning, in case you didn't catch what he said, he was saying it's only appropriate that we talk about the passing of Sarah, that his bride would do the same thing today, that the Lord would bring her into the presence of Yeshua. The little dinosaur on the screen is so you can scan him and get your notes to the message. That's what that's for. Uh, so you can take your phone and you can scan and get the message notes for today. So as we talk about the life of Sarah buried in the cave of Machpelah, Abraham's servant Eliezer of Damascus is going to be dispatched and he's going to go seek a wife for Yitzhak, for Isaac, right? He's going to go find uh, a wife for Isaac among Abraham's people living amongst Mesopotamia. We don't want them to be part of the Canaan folks, the Canaan folk. So we're going to take them all the way from our family Folk, and that's what we're going to see. So this portion also has one of my life verses in it. That's right. My wife's name is Becky, or should I say Rebecca? So this is a life verse. The young woman, Rebecca, was very attractive in appearance. There it is. There it is. All right. So we're going to get into the meat of this here. And uh, so we kind of read Genesis 24. Prime started in verse 9. So I'm going to kind of skip that part for the sake of time because we've already talked about that. But I just want to go to the end of this. Uh, so he says here uh, toward the end of that passage in verse 14. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please tip your jar so that I may drink. And she will say, drink, and I'll also water your camels. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. So by this, I'll know that you have shown graciousness to my master. And so we know what happens here, right? We know the story, and last year we know Jesse kind of gave us the math about this whole thing. But wouldn't it be so much easier if, uh, if camels could just do that? It would just be so much easier, right? Just, just grab 32 bottles and fill up, fellas. Let's go. Come on now. I use those opposable thumbs. Let's drink up some water. But they can't do that, can they? So, uh, <laughs> so instead, we, we have to water them. So this is not just an easy little task. Okay, it's not like we turn on the spigot. And we fill up the camel trough. There is a well involved here. And so Rivka, Rebecca, goes down into this well. Most likely that well was probably not the kind with a little crank on it and a little bucket. It was probably had a little stairwell that went down. So you can imagine, let's do the math for a moment like Jesse did. Ten camels, 30 gallons each if they're really thirsty, 300 gallons of water. If you're really strong, and I'm sure Rebecca is very strong, was very strong because my Rebecca is very strong. Five gallons per trip, let's just say, that's about 40 pounds or so. If you do the math, 60 trips. Six, zero, 60 trips. This was a great lady. So we continue in verse 15. Now, before he had finished speaking, behold, there was Rebekah who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. I just highlighted that so you get the family tree. You understand where this comes from? Going out with her jar on her shoulder. Now, the young woman was very good looking a girl of marriageable age. That's what I said when I met Becky uh, in college. And she was a virgin. She went down to the spring and filled her age, uh, filled her jar to, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me have a sip of water. And, of course, then we know what happens. Drink, my Lord. And she quickly lowered her jar, gave him a drink, and then here, here it comes. Now, when she finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll also draw water for your camels until they finished drinking. So that, that was probably a lot of water there. So she quickly poured out her jug until the trough uh, ran back to the well, drew water, and drew water for all his camels. While the man 
continue to pay close attention to her, keeping silent in order to know whether or not Adonai had made his way successful. Now, I, I want you to get the humor in that verse. I mean, he's silent because he's watching this. It's not Wimbledon. They're going back and forth. She brings water back, he's, and he's watching. Let me tell you, bro, guess what? You picked the right one for sure. You picked, she's the one. Look, if she's going to go draw for 10 camels, she's the one. She is the one. And so we see this here. We're not going to find any better. We're going to find this one right here, and this is the one. Let me just conclude with this thought here, because as we talk about Rebecca and, the, and just the respect that we see here of the amazing things she did for, for Eliezer, let's finish the passage. But her brother with her mother said, this is later on, as, as she's decided, you know, is she going to go? Is she going to uh, marry this guy? Uh, but her brother with her mother said, let the young woman stay with us for a few days or 10. That's every mother's dream, right? Every mother's dream. It's going to happen this weekend for Thanksgiving. Oh, why don't you just stay for a day or a month or a year? That's, that's what they say. So, right, that's why you go from day to 10. You know, it's like hopefully if we say 10, we can negotiate somewhere between 1 and 10 and get you to stay. But he, he said to them, don't delay me since Adonai has made my way successful. Oh, yes, he has. Send me off so I can go to my master. So they said, we'll call the young woman and let's ask her opinion. Oh, I love this. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. I will go. So they went Rebecca. They, they sent Rebecca, their sister, off with her nanny and Abraham's servant. And his, she said, I will go. She's going to give it a go. She's going to take a risk. She's going to go after the prize without knowing what wait, awaits her. In faith, she's going to go. So we see in this portion here, Rebecca ready to go, will, ready, willing, and able. She's done the, the heavy lifting, literally, already. And she is ready to go do this thing. She has the heart of a servant. And she chose to act. And she was not going to dilly-dally around, but she made the decision to go. My wife is much like that at times. She is. She just gets things done. Let me speak to the ladies for just a moment. Many of you ladies in here, many of you women, you are also just like Rebecca. Let me repeat that to make sure that you got that down in your heart and your spirit. You are just like Rebecca. God has called you to difficulty, difficult things. Listen up. I, I, there's this old song by, by Stephen Curtis Chapman. It talks about it just matters to the one who made you, right? He's, 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 the song starts out with you're just at home and you're sweeping up lost Cheerios that got away for the 17th time today, um, and, and just talked about, what, what, does this matter, raising these kids? Yes, it matters. It matters what you do, as long as you do everything for the glory of the one who made you. So, ladies, you receive that today, that you are just like Rebecca. There's a reason why. Amen. You're the reason why when we bless you on Erev Shabbat, we mention her name, because you are to receive a blessing and be blessed just like Rebecca. Rebecca, Sarah, uh, just like Leah, we want you to be blessed. Amen. All right, so we're moving back to our Back to the basic series. I've got 22 minutes to get about 40 minutes for the material in, so here we go. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen quick. So we're currently in relational habits, that section right there. As we talked about this, we're going through relational habits. We've talked about what it means to pray what it means to read your scriptures. That's the vertical aspect of our relationship with God. Then we dealt with the horizontal aspect, right, to uh, have fellowship with one another last week. Today we're going to talk about what it means to share our faith a little bit. So before we do that, let's just quickly review fellowship. And as we talked about fellowship last week, remember we're loving God and we're loving others. We're doing that, but there are some pitfalls we have to avoid, so I'm moving through these quickly. Make sure that when we love others, when we fellowship, don't play the blame and shame game with people. Make sure you love them. Avoid uh, speaking evil or gossip. Uh, we talked about Lashon Hara. Make sure we avoid that. Uh, when we disagree, avoid bitterness, anger, and strife. Okay, we, we can agree to disagree, and you're going to. All right? Listen, you may believe that Adam was born with a belly button. You may believe that. Your brother next to you may wholeheartedly not agree. You may have a fight over it. Don't do that. Okay? And I'm being silly. But, but whatever it might be that you talk about, it's important. Also, follow the fellowship road. Find your group and love them well. 
Make sure you find that group that you're, you're in. I know last uh, Shabbat, last, uh, rather, Havdalah, we had a, a Saturday night time here where our marrieds got together. They found their group. They got to hang out. So thankful uh, for all them. Also, our singles, we had a great open mic night as well. A good crew showed up for that. So they're finding their group, and they're loving them well. That's good. Be a part of a ministry and serve. Jump right in. Do what God's called you to do and be a part of that team. Love and encourage others so that they, uh, they feel known, noticed, and loved. Amen? So as we talk about sharing our faith, uh, if, we, if we could think about the idea of fellowship relating to people within the body of Messiah, sharing is our ability. And when I say sharing, you may use the word evangelism, witness, testimony, uh, whatever it might be. But the, the idea of sharing is, sh- is sharing your faith outside of those who are in the body of Messiah, okay? And, and anybody can look around for three seconds and see that the world needs the Messiah. There's no doubt about it. Uh, just imagine if you're kind of like uh, that person who has, you've been starving, and all of a sudden you've been given the bread of life, and that bread of life has now sustained you for eternity, and you want to do nothing else but share it with somebody else. Uh, your soul is fed, your soul is filled, and you want to share that message with the world and with somebody else. So Yeshua said it this way, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So the first thing you got to do before you can share is make sure you know the one who could feed you in the first place. Make sure you have a growing relationship with him. Make sure that he is on the throne of your heart and your life. Very important. Because the scriptures reveal that believers should share their faith to the whole world. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Let the redeemed of Adonai say so. Whom he redeemed from the hand of the enemy. You were redeemed from the hand of the enemy to do a good work for him in Messiah Yeshua. Also says this, sing to Adonai, bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. We used to sing a song a long time ago, Shira Ladashem. And we would sing about that very verse. We would sing it. Okay? That's what we would do. And it was a wonderful, wonderful song. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. Amen? And I know it's a little uh, trite to say, but sharing is caring. I know you hear it in different contexts, but sharing is caring. You care for somebody enough to tell them about the bread of life. But see, here's what happens. A lot of people think, well, gosh, if I start sharing my faith, God's going to have me on a street corner. He's going to be, you know, want me to proclaim gloom and doom with a big megaphone. And look, there are some folks that are called to that. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to knock those folks. But a lot of folks are like, I'm going to have to go down downtown Houston, and I'm going to have to sit on the corner and tell everybody to repent. I'm going to have to tell them, turn or burn. Get sanctified or be French fried. Get right or get left. There was actually a song, Get Right or Get Left. Remember that song, Becky, way back in the day? Get right or get left. Lord's coming back for you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't want me to sing anymore, do you? Um, I should stop. The idea is, is that God has empowered us. Look what it says in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh has come upon you. And you will be witnesses, right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and through all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Side note, rabbit trail for just a moment. If you read the book of Acts, he says this in Acts 1.8. Then you see the fulfillment of this verse. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. Then where do they send to the gospel next? Judea. Then, when, then where do they go? Samaria. Then where do they go? The uttermost parts of the earth. You see it in the book of Acts. You see this very verse fulfilled right there. Yet, Anybody ever served uh, as a witness in a courtroom? Raise your hand if you've ever been a part of a trial. You've had to be a witness. Well, that's, a, that's a very important job. If you're a witness, let's say a woman witnesses a crime, that person is a witness to that crime whether or not they want to be. I'm just saying, they are. They have now witnessed it. They may have a lot of fear and trepidation about the fact that they are a witness, but it doesn't change the fact that you're a witness. Guess what? If you're in the kingdom of God, you're a witness. Newsflash for you. If you're in the kingdom of God, you are a witness. You see, being a witness is who you are, not merely something you do. It's who you are. It's in your DNA if you know Messiah Yeshua. It comes out of you because of who you are in Messiah Yeshua. See, the more, let me give you a truth here. The more you give away your faith, the more faith you have. 
It's, it's an amazing thing. It's like loaves and fish. Just keep coming up and coming up and coming up. God will bring that faith. It's important. I know many believers, new believers especially, we feel kind of awkward about how to share our faith. Can I give you a couple of examples of just how we can relate to this in our lives and how easy it really is? Let me show you a picture. My wife didn't know I was going to put this picture in. This is, these are our kids. This is, this is what we call the squad pic at Sarah's wedding. Okay, we had a serious picture, and then they said, squad pic pose, and all the guys get down and do their thing, and the girls get all, you know, that's their squad pose, all right? Listen, I love those four people. I will sit for hours and hours and hours, if you will let me tell you all about their lives. I also love this extended group of folks. This was Jonathan's graduation last year, and added to our family has been Hannah, Jacob's wife, and Nick, Sarah's husband. And so these six folks, I love them. I will sit and I will tell story after story after story. My wife is beside herself. Thanksgiving cannot come fast enough because the whole crew's coming in. Even the one in Brooklyn is coming. And so she is so excited. Why can't we get that excited about telling the Lord about the Lord to other people? What is it that we can automatically, I will tell you about my wife and how amazing she is. And I will sit there, but all of a sudden the, the, the topic of God and Yeshua comes up, and, whoop, and all of a sudden we're afraid about what we can say, what people will think, what people will wonder about us. The most important thing in our lives, our family, we will tell you all about, but the one who saved our soul, sometimes whoop, we get quiet about that. And that, brothers, that not ought so to be. This is how Yeshua put it. Therefore, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. That's why I believe it is so important for believers. Once they come, become a, a believer in Yeshua, they're born again, born uh, from up on high, that they go through immersion, through believer's immersion, because it is, it is that moment where they are a witness to the world to say, I am not ashamed. I am a follower of Yeshua, the Messiah, and I'm so grateful for him in my life. So in the, my closing moments here, I want to just give us four things quickly about how to talk to your friends and really your family, your coworkers, anybody for that matter, about your faith. Some practical things. And listen, this is not an exclusive list. Uh, you could probably come up with 12 others that I haven't thought about, but just these four to keep it kind of simple. First of all, be a practical witness. Be a practical witness. Listen, to start sharing the Word of God with other people, you've got to live the Word of God in front of other people. Okay? Hear what I'm saying? Listen, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit some people real hard. Actually, not you folks because you're Shabbat keepers. But let's just, I, I heard this a long time ago, a, a st statistic. For those who go uh, after uh, Sunday service to go to lunch, I may have shared this with you before, but if I did, just act like you haven't heard it. Um, when you go to church uh, on Sunday and then go to lunch, all the, all the wait staff are not excited because the people that tip the worst are the folks coming from the church. Brothers and sisters, that not ought so to be. Let loose that wild a little bit, and let's bless the people who are giving us food. And listen, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm a big tipper because I think it is so important, not just because my daughters spent so many years doing it, but I think it's an opportunity to be able to witness and share our faith with people. Yeah, I want to share you about Yeshua, and here's a 25 cents for our $100 bill. Come on, people. Let's open up that wallet and let's begin to be generous and willing to share what God's given us. And so not just to share what God's given us physically but spiritually as well. So it's important that we do this. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be made salt again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it under on a lampstand so it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. So our first thing we've got to do is give them a chance to be able to see God's good works through you. Amen? That's what we've got to do. Uh, once again, I'm going back to some old songs. Shine. Let them wonder what you got. From the Newsboys. I happen to have on good authority that Richard Freeman likes the Newsboys. 
He has a song he listens to almost every day. Let me just read the words to the chorus to this song in case you're not familiar with this old tune. Shine. Make them wonder what you got. Make it, yeah, sing it along if you know it. Make them wish that they were not. On the outside looking bored. Shine. Let it shine before all men. Let them see good works and then let them glorify the Lord. Bow down, 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 down. Shine. Let them wonder what you got. Make them wish that they were not on the outside looking bored. Down, 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 down. Shine. Let it shine before all men. Let him see good works and then let him glorify the Lord. Ba -da 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 shine. Yoo-hoo. Great job, everybody. Things are so organic in the message. I had no idea that was going to happen. That's so fun. So fun. Listen, goodness and kindness are evidence of a changed life. So live out goodness and kindness in the world. Folks, I know it's hard. I get it. I understand, but that's what we're called to do. God's called us to do that. Number two, pray for the lost and those friends or family who, you, who do not know Yeshua and then put action to those prayers. Put action to those prayers. All right, listen, write down your testimony. This is part of number two. Write down your testimony. Every person who joins Beth Messiah, we ask them on their membership application to write down their testimony. Why? Because it's important that we understand your faith journey and that you can communicate that faith journey. You can articulate it in your own words. It's important for you to do that. Number two, have a friend or a mentor help share with you. All right, bring a friend along. Yeshua did that. He sent them out by twos, right? He sent them out. In fact, Yeshua sent his emissaries out in twos because a witness of two people is trustworthy. Deuteronomy 19.15, right from the Torah. Also, if you, if you get to that point, listen, maybe you can't close the deal, but bring them to the place where God can. Invite them to a service. Invite them to synagogue. Let the Ruach HaKodesh close the deal. Look, it's not Rabbi John or uh, Jesse or Richard Freeman that's closing the deal. We're just the mouthpiece for what God is doing in their hearts. Close the deal with the Ruach HaKodesh. Amen? Remember, I want you to really get this. Remember, you're planting a seed not an entire tree. You're planting a seed. That's your job. Your job is to plant the seed and let other folks probably also do some work and then let the Spirit of God water and watch it grow. That's exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God's going to grow the tree. Our job is to plant the seed. That's what he wants us to do. Amen? And how do we make sure that we can do that? Well, first of all, we conduct ourselves with wisdom towards those who are outside. Making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, to know how you ought to answer everyone. Anybody ever had too much salt in their food? Yeah, look, so the idea here is don't take your friend for the first time to hear the gospel and draw the entire end times tribulation map on a napkin during dinner. <laughs> there you go, brother. <laughs> Turn or burn. <laughs> Sanctified or French fried. Probably not going to go over well, okay? We want to make sure that we share with love, all right? Number three, be ready anytime in any season. To share. We never know when the opportunity is going to come up. God will do something unbelievable, like Rabbi Ron calling a relative and seeing them come to faith after 30 years. Always be ready. Instead, sanctify Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Amen. Part of that is that we should be able to prepare our testimony. If you've never done this, I encourage you to prepare your testimony. At the end of the service today, I'm going to show you a five-minute clip of a Jewish man named Israel Cohen and his five-minute testimony. I love it because it is five minutes. It doesn't need to be 21 minutes. It can be three to five minutes. All right, that first minute, tell them about the life before Messiah, what you were like, who you were before that time. Then in the second minute, how you came to the Messiah. What was your experience? What did God do to change your life? That third minute plus, 
your life change after the Messiah. And hopefully there's a life change after Messiah. That's the goal, right? Number four, be persuasive but remain humble, recognizing when you do not know the answers to questions. That was my problem the first 20 years out of the box because I wanted to put everybody in their theological place and tell them exactly how much they were wrong. That is not sharing and caring, okay? That's just wanting to be right, okay? We don't want to do that. All right, this is, let me look at the second part of that verse. Here it is again. Uh, always be ready to give an answer. What's the second part of that? Yet with humility and reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that whatever you, you are accused of or, or, or who abused you for good conduct and Messiah may be put to shame. That whole passage is talking about persecution. But the point here is with humility and reverence, we want to be able to share the good news. Amen? It's very important. In the world we live in today, you will be called all sorts of names. As believers, you know what the world says about you. Don't let it hold on to you. Don't let it cling. Whether they call you a racist, a homophobe, a xenophobe, a backwoods Bible thumper, whatever it might be, don't let that hold on to you. And listen, do not change God's standard living in you because the world changes their standard. Do not do it. You've got the truth. You've got the hope in you. Yeshua went to those who were less and came for the sick. And many accuse him today of, oh, yeah, he was just like them. No, he went to where they were and brought them up to that level because he changed them. He didn't change his standard. They changed where they were and their position because of what he did. I use this all the time. The woman caught in adultery. Yeshua's there, and he says, where are your accusers? They've, they've left. Well, I don't accuse you either. Have a nice day. No. Go and sin no more. So there's the completion to that idea, and so we do it. This is Israel and Judy Cohen. They are just a bottle of lightning. And uh, soundboard people, I'm going to let you know I'm going to play a video here right after the slide, so just be ready for the sound. Israel Cohen is a, a Navy veteran, and he has an amazing testimony. We've seen this a couple times at the MJA conference walking around. You'll know they're from Philly, and they're loud, and it's awesome. So let's hear from Israel Cohen as we close today. Amen. I mean, I heard about some of these, these guys like John the Baptist. He's a Baptist. I found out later on he's Jewish. St. Paul, Jewish? Yeah, Jewish. St. Peter, how can anybody by the name of St. Peter be Jewish? Guess what? I found out they're all Jewish. Now, I grew up in Philadelphia in a Jewish neighborhood on the other side of the street. That was mostly Gentiles. These poor Gentiles, they would worship a statue. Some of those people had statues in their lawns. At the age of eight years old, I joined the Cub Scouts, which is part of the Boy Scouts. They had a, they have, they still probably have this today, a, a magazine. It's called Boy's Life Magazine. And in that magazine, they had the instructions on how to build a, a crystal radio. I was so excited. It was, it was like I was in heaven with this radio that worked. I would rush home from school and put on the earphones. And I was hearing these people talking about Jesus on the short wave, they were like, in the, name of Jesus. the same time I was preparing for my bar mitzvah, and my rabbi told me, never believe in Jesus, and never read the New Testament, that's a Gentile book, and Jesus is for the Gentiles. I joined the Navy in 1960 and wound up in a, in a drill hall with 400 guys. Now this is the first time in my life I was ever away from my mother and father. They taught me how to smoke a cigarette. Uh, you know, oh, I was coughing like crazy. They said, real sailors drink whiskey. And that was burning my throat. I did it because I wanted to be a real sailor. I wound up getting drunk every night. Wound up going out with, with women that I shouldn't be doing. Sometimes deep down inside of me, I was saying, man, this doesn't feel right. Something's wrong here. This doesn't seem right. You see, when you join the Navy, I don't know if they do this today anymore, but this was back in 1960. We were naked and had our hair shaved, and then we went through the line to get our uniforms and stuff. At the end of the line, they said Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. So they gave you a Bible. I had my Tanakh. I had my little, my Jewish scriptures. And I don't know what you do with the Bible. I thought, you know, it might be like a rabbit's foot, good luck charm, or maybe it'd be like my grandmother's chicken soup. Anytime I was sick, my grandmother said, have some matzo ball soup, have some chicken soup. It'll, I said, well, it help. She said, it couldn't hide, you know. I said, well, I have a Bible. Will it help? Well, it couldn't hide, you know. Uh, one of the sailors uh, that I was with in the Navy 
He said to me, you're Jewish, right? I said, yeah. Do you have a Bible? I said, sure, I have a Bible. They gave it to me when I joined the Navy. He said, let me see your Bible. And he turned in my Bible to Isaiah chapter 53. And he said, here, read this. I read the whole chapter of Isaiah 53. I said, wait a minute. This sounds like those folks across the street. This sounds like the Gentiles. This sounds like what I was hearing on the short wave. They made a mistake. They gave me New Testament. And my rabbi told me, never read the New Testament. You better take this because this is for you. This is not my Bible. He said, no, no, look, Hebrew Publishing Company. <gasps> Hebrew Publishing Company. What's, this is crazy. What's Jesus doing in my Bible? He said, well, he's your Messiah. He's my Messiah. I, I, I was shocked. And he said, would you like to read about that in the New Testament? I said, uh, well, I can't read the New Testament because my rabbi told me never read uh, the New Testament. And he looked around over here and he looked over here. And he says, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't tell your rabbi that you read the New Testament, I won't tell him either. I thought about that for a minute. Said, okay, but I was scared. I thought lightning was going to strike me. I actually thought I was going to be struck by lightning. I expected it to be a Gentile book. I expected it to take place in Rome with a bunch of popes talking about Catholic things and statues. What surprised me is how Jewish the New Testament really is. It's the most Jewish book I ever read. The more I, I, I read the scriptures, the more I, I was, was praying, I realized that inside I was not, not clean. Inside. I had all kinds of anger. I was getting drunk every night. I was going with the women. I was smoking three packs of unfiltered palm all day, coughing like crazy. I was making pretend like I enjoyed it. I didn't want to make pretend anymore. I didn't want to live that way anymore. Now it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm in the barracks, big barracks. And I had a blanket all the way over and, and the light was shining on the New Testament. And I, I prayed, you know, Baruch Atah Anonai Elohim Amalek Olam. Lord, uh, uh, Jesus, I, I'm here. Uh, um, I want to believe in you, and I went to bed. May 16th, 1961, came to faith in, in the Messiah. That's just so important in my life. It's, it's a, a, a moment that totally, completely changed the revolution of my life. Even if I was the very last person on earth, Jesus would still have died for me. And I am confident when I die, I'll go to be with him. Amen. 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 They, he is 83 years old now, and he and his wife still serve with Chosen People Ministries in Philadelphia, doing ministry work for Chosen People at 83. Amazing people. So listen, let your light shine before men. Let them see the good works, your good works, so they can glorify their Father in heaven. And how do they do that? By finding the way, the truth, and the life, the door. Yeshua, the Messiah. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you today. First of all, Lord, that you sent your Son to die on that cross, that tree, to give us eternal life. To be able to realize that, Lord, we've broken your law. We've, we've sinned before you and we need forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for Yeshua. And, Father, for those of us in this room who know Yeshua, Lord, we ask that you would give us more opportunities to share our faith. Just like we share with our friends about our family and our wives, our spouses. Lord, may we do the same thing for you. Be faithful and unshakable about our faith with you, Lord, as we share. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for um, Rabbi Ron and his family, Lord. We just ask blessings and uh, grace and shalom over him today, Lord, as they continue this process. Lord, may we continue to lift him up in prayer. Lift up Terry and Missy and the boys, the family, the girls. Lord, bless them. We thank you, Father, for this word today. We thank you for uh, this rain today, Lord God. Rain on our hearts supremely, Lord. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.